Whew, that was a lot of information to take in, wasn't it? Uh, not just the Bible reading, but you know, all of everything that's happening um, and everything that's going to happen at Aldenga as we kind of go into a new season, change a lot of things, um, but go into a new normal. Uh, so why don't I pray uh, and then we can get into the message. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that we are in a warm building at the start of the cold snap. Uh, we thank you that there need not be any blankets um, or chilly toes, uh, but that we can be here in uh, a great space, meeting as your people, under your word, by your spirit. And we pray that you would, you would settle us. We pray that, we would give a, we pray that you would give us a heart to listen to your words. Um, and, and the strength and the courage to receive them and to put them into action. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray this. Amen. Amen. But the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. We're talking about sheep, shepherds. This is a particularly pastoral sermon this morning. We hear good shepherd, and what do we immediately assume? I know for myself, I assume, well, I guess that makes us sheep, and I'm not wrong there, right? The good shepherd has to look after his sheep. But then I went to thinking, if Jesus is the good shepherd, then, right, must need bad sheep. We must be John. Uh, sorry, Luke's sheep, like in Luke's gospel, the, uh, the stinky, the dumb, the wayward sheep that Jesus leaves for all others because we've gone and gotten ourselves lost. Uh, but you'll be pleased to know that all the comparisons for us to stinky, dumb, wayward sheep stops here. Um, this isn't a passage I don't particularly think about us as the sheep. See, I think when Jesus talks about himself being the good shepherd, this is about who the sheep have, who we have for a shepherd in Jesus. Now, I've got, I don't have many stories to tell about sheep, but I am a bit of a dreamer. I love imagining. And so we just recently got a border collie called Yoko. Uh, she's about a year old and we love her. But when we knew that we were getting her and she wasn't quite here yet, uh, she was still a puppy, I spent way too much time going down a YouTube rabbit hole uh, watching old English and Scottish men, the shepherds, with their collies, showing people how to shepherd with their dogs. And I was imagining Yoko's future as an urban sheepdog. <laughs> Unfortunately for me, I don't have any rugged hillsides and I don't have any sheep. So Yoko's resigned herself to the fluffy white dogs at the park. Um, but what struck me in those hours, and they were hours I spent watching those sheep, the sheep shepherd and the sheepdog, is that just as much as the sheepdog and the shepherd work together and they belong to herding the sheep, the sheep actually belong to being herded. That's the way they're bred. That's the way they understand their life. They know what to do. They're safe, secure, and living life to the full whenever they're taken to wherever they need to go. Sheep belong to their shepherd. So we're continuing our series of Footsteps of the King. We're living in this Eastertide period, right, where Jesus is risen. We remember Jesus being with his disciples, teaching them, blessing them with understanding. It says in Luke's Gospel, um, in chapter 24, he opened their minds so that they could understand the Scriptures. The disciples were being trained. They were being taught how to understand the Bible in order for them to go out. For us, I think, the question is, what does it mean to belong to him. What is so good about the good shepherd? If sheep belong to their shepherd, and they do, if they follow their voice, what do we hear the voice of Jesus say? And I think the voice of Jesus says that everyone belongs at the table of the good shepherd. So getting into the passage, 
The first question is, is this image of the good shepherd, is it, is it earthen, is it dirty, or is it spiritual? You know, is it, is it about things above or is it about things below? And what Jesus is saying in chapter 10 actually relates to chapter 9. This is kind of an explanation, a discourse about what happened in chapter 9. Does anyone know what happened in chapter 9? Jesus heals the man born blind, right? He, um, he, gets spit, he spits in his hands, picks up a bit of dirt, rubs it in his hands, and then does the unthinkable thing of putting his hands in the man's eyes, and he, and he sees. And he does this in front of the Pharisees, the religious experts of the day. They see it, they get all riled up. And Jesus and John's gospel uses it as a point to point out their own spiritual blindness, right? It's a pretty effective picture. The man born blind sees who Jesus is and the Pharisees who spent their entire lives uh, looking at the law, figuring out how to follow God, can't even see Jesus. So Jesus begins chapter 10 by saying that he's the door, that he's the gate to the sheep pen. He says, unless you come by me, you're only here to disrupt what I'm doing. You're only here to steal, kill, and destroy. I think not only is that an incredible accusation to throw before the people that uh, have been following God their entire lives, but before everyone else, right? He's pointing to all the people who are following the Pharisees and is saying, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be trusting everything that they say. These people who try and enter the flock of God, uh, not by means of me, they're only here to steal, kill, and destroy. These are people who for hundreds of years have devoted themselves to staying true and accountable to God and doing so that they could lead others, right? Theologically, Jesus would have been very close to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the evangelicals of the day. So Jesus is telling the college students, the Bible study leaders, the pastors, that if they don't acknowledge him as the door, the gate to all life, then they are agents of destruction. And this is incredible claim, right? That Jesus himself is the way to life. And what is striking is that he uses the image of a shepherd to show his own authority over this life. And a question I've been asking myself this week as I've been preparing, and honestly, I still can't quite answer it, is why a shepherd? Why does Jesus pick the image of a shepherd? I get the herding analogies and the safety which Jesus picks up on. But what are the Pharisees? What are the people that he's actually talking to in this passage? What are the Pharisees hearing? Is Jesus' message down to earth or spiritual? Because in those days, being a shepherd was dirty work, right? It's 24-7, it's isolated. I think maybe we've got an idealised of what being a shepherd was in uh, ancient Palestine because of King David, right? King David, the shepherd. But I think this speaks even more to the hand of God in the rule of David that a dirty, isolated young man would become king. I think that's the story of King David from shepherd to king. So is Jesus saying to the Pharisees, look, you know-it-alls, get your head out of the clouds and start seeing me as one who is here, one who is incarnate, with messy, with dirty feet. If you can't see me as the shepherd, don't bother trying to get in the sheep pen. Or to the Pharisees, is he speaking their language? Is he saying that you know that God is a shepherd? You've read the scriptures, you've read Psalm 23, that Psalm of David that attributes to God everything that a good shepherd does. You know that the nation of Israel is his flock and that he takes care of them. Is Jesus saying, I'm telling you that I am the sent one of God, the only son. Make that connection to God being, your, God being the shepherd and me. Open your eyes to see that I am the reality of these spiritual things, and you will know and have life in the God that you worship. And that question between whether Jesus is talking about earthly things or spiritual things, I kind of set it up as a false dichotomy, right? I think they're actually one and the same. This is the message of the incarnation. This is the heart of Christianity. When Jesus says in verse 12 that the hired hand is not the shepherd, 
and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. When Jesus says that, I think he means to say that the reality of shepherding, leading people to a life that they belong to, is too important to be left to the hired hand. See, I don't think God is Telstra. I don't think God outsources knowledge of him. He doesn't outsource the care that he gives. He gives us the spirit. He does not outsource salvation. He gives us Jesus. Jesus is that shepherd who has come tired, dirty and thirsty to take care of his flock. He is the one who stands up against the wolf and he is the one that lays himself down in front of it. You see, the fact that Jesus is here on earth and knows us, when he says, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep and my sheep know me, this is the same outcome as Jesus knowing the Father. He says, he says my sheep know me, and he goes on, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. See, there's an assurance that we can know God like Jesus does because Jesus knows us the same way that he knows his Father. To put it a different way, you gain a deeper understanding of someone if you meet someone just like them, right? I think of my wife, Lil. How much more she made sense when I really got to know her family. Uh, maybe you've got Christian brothers and sisters from another church. You happen to visit that church one day. All of a sudden, all their phrases, the way that they talk, the mannerisms, the way that they pray, even the way that they think about the world, all makes so much more sense because you know where they come from, you know their community, you know who they know. See, Jesus, when we know him, we can be assured of knowing the God of our salvation. For Jesus knows us just like he knows his Father. And this is the point where Jesus points himself out to be different to any other kind of saviour, messiah or king ever known, ever. Like he said, he stands up against the wolf and he lays down his life for the sheep. This is why he's the good shepherd. And I think there's something in this word good that gets lost when we say it. Good also means true. It also means ultimate, complete, finished, there's a sense of finality to the word good when it's used like this. Think of another instance of the time that good is used like this, Good Friday. Why would we ever dare to call the day that Jesus died good? It's a day of mourning. It's a day of remembrance. But Jesus says in verse 17, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. You see, the reason that Good Friday is so good, that it's so final and ultimate, is because Jesus finishes his work on the cross. Jesus shows that he is the good shepherd when he lays down his life for the sins of the world and not only completes his work, but makes us and every move, every, every moment, every person, every existence ever made in the entire universe good. Good with God, complete and true. We may as well call Good Friday done and dusted Friday, right? All tied up Friday, mission accomplished, stick a fork in it, the fat lady sung Friday. I don't, I don't mean to be irreverent. But just as the good shepherd makes good on his promises that Friday, on the cross for which he bore our sins, he also makes us good. Capital G. Complete and true. See, I think if, if we're following Jesus this morning, the problem with the Pharisees, and we share this same problem, the problem with us is that even though we know sin, we're aware of it. We know the effect it has on us, how it wreaks havoc. There are still parts of our lives we can't see it in. 
In our sin, we convince ourselves that it only touches that which is outside of God's domain. Right? When we come to God, we don't have sin in us. It doesn't affect the way that we relate to God. Um, and just as, as Jesus makes us in a right relationship with God, we, we still have sin that affects the way that we live, right? Because the whole world is God's, right? We can't convince ourselves that there's a part of our lives that God doesn't exist in. Doesn't the Bible say the earth is the Lord's and everything in it? From, you know, from, from the hills to the plains, uh, to summer to winter. See, we tell ourselves... Sin's only there when we do things outside of God's domain. When I come to God, there's not a blemish on my record or in my thoughts. Or maybe you're here this morning and God is distant precisely because you feel the weight of your sin and God is unapproachable. But here's the good news, the beauty of the gospel. Sin is a state of being, not doing why does King David ask God to purify his heart, to create a clean heart within him? Because we exist broken. I think if we were all really true with ourselves, we'd understand that. We exist not good, not complete, not true. We can't just do, we don't just do wrong, right? We don't just do not good. Because then it would be easy to fix, right? Nike would have the message of salvation, just do it. Just do good. No sin. But Jesus is telling us that the only way for him to shepherd us is to make us good as he is good. Jesus isn't even talking about us making us do good, right? Which is an outcome of us being right with God. He is concerned with us being good, having the good life that he offers, going in and out, finding pasture, life to the full, led to streams of living water where we do not need to want for anything. Jesus' death on the cross shows us and gives us a new way to new life. Only he who is good, who is complete and true, can make us good as he is good. You know, he says a similar thing on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, be perfect as my Father is perfect. If we look to our shepherd Jesus, who laid down his life as a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins, we are made perfect. We're made good as he is. Jesus on the cross says it is finished. We are finished. We find our home. We belong at the table of the good shepherd. Yeah, I think it's all too clear that we aren't there right yet. We, yet, we aren't there yet, right? So <laughs> should have right, written that better. Things just rob the wrong way. Tragedy is all too normal. This life seems to be one big valley called the shadow of death. Maybe at the moment, I know it feels like this for me, disruption is king in your life. Disruption, isolation. I was just thinking about Friday night um, for no one's, no one's fault, uh, but I set up for Friday night for a youth band that we're trying to do for, for some of the youth uh, at the church, only to get a call from someone that the house had come down with COVID. No more band. And I really think that this last six months have been a reckoning for all of the changes that were made at the start of the pandemic two years ago. I know maybe you're a teacher and you haven't felt like you've been able to teach because of the, because of the disruptions in the classroom. I know maybe this morning you're listening to a sermon in church for the first time in a long time, between sickness, serving, disruptions. I hope it's worth it. Maybe it feels like all around you, people are coming out of their shells, finding ways to thrive. You're stuck at a dead end, not knowing what, it, what you wanted your life to be like before all these changes happened. And so... The fact that we all belong at the table of the Good Shepherd is my last point. And it's not so much a solution as it is an invitation. I want you to hear that Jesus is inviting you to his table. We all belong at the table of the Good Shepherd. The table that is prepared in the midst of our enemy, the big enemy, our being of sin. 
Amidst all of this, Jesus shares his new life with us. The new life that he took up by himself because he laid it down. We all belong and we all belong together. One shepherd, one flock. Disruption affects what we do, not who we are. If we are the good sheep of the good shepherd, we are cared for, we are nurtured and we are safe. Jesus came into the world to go out to seek and save the lost. He says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. There shall be one flock and one shepherd. Just want us to entertain the thought for one second that if you belong to Jesus, 2,000 years ago, when these words were uttered, he had you as an individual in mind. Just as he had the nations, just as he had the, those who belonged to him in mind, you were to belong to the flock and the one shepherd. And if you don't belong to Jesus this morning, these words are still an invitation, right? The table is still prepared. The food is still warm and good and the company is life-giving and the journey will never end. Goodness and mercy will follow you as you follow the good shepherd. So it's a timely reminder that disruption is not the mortal enemy of our lives. Isolation is not the mortal enemy of our friendships. The joy and hope and peace of being in Jesus, belonging to the flock, is that our very beings are changed. We are, we're, we're gone from not good to good because we are made good by Jesus. We're made alive. Jesus' table is full of friends. Our small groups, our church, our coffee dates, our lives with each other is one long table that we come to even in the midst of our enemies. As Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. For the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, the one who you sent to be the good shepherd, to make us good as he is good, to renew our very beings, to show us what it is to belong to you, to go in and out, to find pasture and to have life to the full. We pray that this would be our, our hope, our joy and our peace, and that as we draw near to Jesus, we would know what it is to have life in you. Amen.